Hello, I'm Portia Young. In this edition of 1036, we're going to take you on a journey to a small town in the northwest part of the state. 1036 producers, along with a reporter from the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, had been working on a documentary on the Wisconsin dairy crisis when COVID-19 hit. They spent time in one small dairy town that had not recorded a single case of the virus, yet the pandemic hit the town hard. Following the documentary you're about to watch, we'll talk with the film's producers about how the pandemic also affected their work and the production of this story. Now, Pandemic and the Heartland. I'm Rick Barrett, a reporter with the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel and USA Today Network. For the past year, I've been covering one of the worst downturns in dairy farming in decades. One of those dairy towns is Loyal, Wisconsin, in Clark County, in the northwest part of the state. I recently returned to see how this city of 1,300 people is dealing with a new and historic crisis, the COVID-19 pandemic. I arrived shortly after the governor's stay-at-home order took effect in late March. Loyal had recorded zero cases of COVID-19, yet the virus hit the city hard. Spring is usually a time of hope and renewal. Instead, closed signs and darkened storefront windows offer a glimpse into the damage. It wasn't hard to find folks to tell me just how hard it's been. I mean, the bills still roll in, but you got no money to pay stopped everything completely. It's hard to make money around here, and then they shut it down for three months. A farmer will spread manure in the morning, and in the afternoon come to town and spread money. But if he hasn't got the money to spread in the afternoon, he's not, he's not gonna be there. We have a tavern across the road. I asked him what he felt he was losing per day with this shutdown, and he said, easy $2,000 a day. I walked down Main Street to meet up with someone who knows just how much small businesses need help. Sheila Nyberg is the county's economic development director. Her office is in downtown Loyal, and she only has to glance out her window to see how quiet everything is. More like a Sunday than a work day. This has been one of the hardest things that we've all been through. Um, Yes, you know, we had, yes, we've had the downturn in the economy in 08. We went through that, picked our bootstraps up and marched forward, got back in the, back in the game. Um, and now you look at this, um, we've had five plus years of bad things for our, our dairy. Our, our agriculture and dairy has been going into six years of nothing positive. Not much, and it's it just you know just tanked. In the middle of all this, then your agriculture, which you are so proud of, and you are all about producing food and product from the dairy industry and, and the meat side of it. This, on top of the COVID, is the test that we've never had to face before. So we jumped in, and we've been communicating through the people that are in the knowledge, spinning the numbers. And we're communicating with Washington and putting it out there and saying, this is what you have to do if you really mean that we're important. If you really mean that we're important as a rural and agriculture and dairy and our little bitty towns and this little bitty main streets are important to you, this is the way you need to lay out the rest, the next pile of money. Otherwise, we aren't even, it is, if it is even getting through the sieve to get to us, it is not. And the farm families, has it affected them deeply? I mean, they're, getting a, they're getting a double hit here from COVID and from... Yeah, yes. The farm families in our region, it, it's unbelievably tough. It, it is. Um, yeah, yeah. And then I look at 
some of the um, programs that were out there and working with some of the families that have called, and, and the, they're working with their bankers and what have you, and the programs that were supposed to be federal programs, and trying to sift through them and finding out that most of the smalls couldn't get anything. When, when we realized that, and that's what we found out, and we're t sending people to go through this process and find out they can't even hardly qualify for anything. One of them got 84 bucks. After all that paperwork and calculation and what have you, and then you see that, we certainly don't have it right. We certainly don't have it right. And it, it, it makes you even sicker and sadder. I took a drive to visit one of these farms, the Wreath Farm on Chickadee Road, just a few miles from downtown Loyal. It's been in the family since 1948. They milk 250 cows, a mid-sized dairy operation in this county, where there are twice as many dairy cows as people. Last year after taxes, the Wreath Farm only made $500. And now, COVID-19 adds to their worries. They're not alone. After five years of low milk prices, 2020 was forecast to be a recovery year for the dairy industry. But economists are now expecting prices to plummet with the coronavirus impacting demand and threatening the dairy workforce. I'm scared. I really am. It's, uh, it's, a, it's going to be tough. You know, I'm, you wonder how you're going to get everything done with the crop and then everything else. I don't go very many places unless I have to. You know, we, we're pretty much homebound here, and uh, we got to be careful. I have to be careful because a few years ago I burnt my lungs with mold, so my lungs are probably not would be susceptible to this if I did get it. So I got to be very, very careful. So I got laid off from Marshfield Clinic. I was a training assistant there, so that kind of affected the side income. So I'm depending on him more <laughs> and an unemployment check that I'm waiting for yet. But it's been quite a hit that way. The Reese say they're in the hole about $300,000 this year alone. Big debt is not unusual for farmers trying to make ends meet. And in this pandemic year, it's been even harder. We're going to be back to 09. 09, milk prices were $9 a hundred. And farmers can't live on that. This there's, is going to call out even more. There's no way farmers can live on this. And grain prices are no good. You know, beef prices are not there. Um, I don't know how they think rural America is supposed to survive this. What's a good outcome for you this year? If we could break even and nobody got sick and died, and we had our health, and we broke even. Break even for a few months at least. I, I would be, I'd thank the Lord. That sense of hope is also felt back in the city, where loyal residents continue to lean on each other for help and support. Most of these cars driving by, I know who they are. We know our neighbors. I think you can trust everybody around you and they're watching out for you, you're watching out for them. And it's just a friendly little town. Before coronavirus, loyal was like it was a, a very tight-knit community, and I think it will stay that way. There are people who band together, and they always have in this town. And I, that's bringing that out now, and I don't see that changing at all. Um, and it's not going to change anything politically either. This loyal's in the middle of a conservative area, and it, I can't foresee that changing in my lifetime. It's in this city's DNA to embrace loyalty, 
even when it comes at a steep cost. Legend has it that Loyal got its name because every single eligible man in town enlisted to fight for the Union in the Civil War. That spirit's still alive today in the pandemic, what some call a war on humanity. Everybody's grateful that we're alive, we're well, we're able to take care of our neighbors and our friends and help each other out. Boy, that's, that's a number one in this town. Let's be part of the solution, not part of the problem. And I believe that's what you get with small town character. And what you get are companies retooling themselves. Well, we're busy making drapery and bedspreads and we uh, totally converted the plant over to face mask production. Sometimes I think when times get very tough, I think uh, people pull together. And I think that's what's happening here. I think that's what happened across the whole country. You just see all these little small little operations pulling together and try to uh, deal with this, with, you know, with this enemy, with this virus, and to defeat it. We'll find a way to survive. We'll just, uh, uh, it, you, you have to kind of sometimes uh, recreate or reinvent yourself as you go along. And we've always had to do that with our different product lines and so on. And um, so I think we'll be fine. And new business owners had to quickly adapt, like dance instructor Holly Rohde, a U.S. Navy veteran. In January of this year, I um, knew that the old BP gas station in Loyal was um, up for sale. So I purchased it, renovated it, opened it March 9th, and closed the doors March 16th. So just like on Tuesday, we're gonna do our skips, all right? So we're gonna swing our arms and lift our feet. We've been using Zoom and Facebook Live um, for our classes, and I used to teach um, high school online, so I was familiar with working in the online setting and teaching. So that was very comfortable with, for me, so I knew exactly what I needed to do, but I knew teaching dance would be somewhat of a challenge. Ooh, I see some strong shoulder muscles today. Try to think that you're placing your hands on a line and that your legs and feet are coming back to that same line. I think I've remained optimistic through all of this, um, but deep down I'd say anxious is, is a good word. Um, you know, not sure, but just because I don't know how everyone else is going to react. You know, are my customers going to, how are they going to feel about coming back to dance? Meanwhile, the school district handed out 300 lunches a day. Here you go, gentlemen. Have a great day. Something the mayor says was critical. Probably a godsend for some parents. They're laid off. They have multiple kids at home. And residents in this dairy town thank the alumni from Future Farmers of America for distributing milk to folks. Now that the governor's stay-at-home order is over, Loyal is slowly reopening. When you think about it, all of a sudden, it's a, it, it, the, the, the light switch flipped. And I, I thought everybody kind of was pre kind of prepared that really wanted to see it happen now. But it turned out that what we're seeing is no, not really. I think they're all going, okay, what do, I, what do my clients want? My clients are chiming in. My, you know, what is my feeling about protecting people? I have, you know, there's nobody telling me I have to do this, this, and this, but I still feel strongly that I need to protect my clients, my family. I buy a bunch of people. How would I take that virus home if I'm not careful? They're trying to figure out, yeah, there's some, step back a minute. And let's think about this. If I open my doors, now what? Shortly after the governor's announcement, I met a local resident outside the post office who was on furlough from his job as a physician assistant. Uh, this has been a long journey, and it's been a hard journey for, for everybody. I mean, there, I don't think there's anybody in the world who hasn't been affected by this. In a small community like Loyal, where we are, <laughs> You know, we're, we're only a little under 1,300 people here, and, and everybody is, is, is used to seeing each other out on the street and, and doing things. And it, this has been 
challenging. I'm hoping that there's going to be some new social awareness come out of this. Maybe this is, we've become as a society so s separated because of, of technology and people doing their stuff electronically rather than face to face. But also I think we've become a less kinder, gentler nation. And I'm hoping that this, that this COVID pandemic and the situation that's created, I hope it's gonna give everybody a new appreciation for just how important we are to each other. We, we, we don't live isolated lives and we have to be nice to each other. We have to protect and take care of each other. So people might be a bit more cautious as they gather at the American Legion steak feed, the local burger stand, you, Kevin, 350. or at a favorite tavern like Shelby's Pub. Well, I've got some really great customers, they, I do, and they're very devoted and very loyal. We're gonna have to take a lot of precautions and you know, everybody being sanitary with the hand washing and, and uh, when people leave, I'm gonna have to do the wet wipes and the Lysol and the Clorox bleach, you know, to keep everything, you know. So it's gonna be a lot of work for me, but it'll be worth it to have people back in here. I've lost pretty much 80% of my uh, income and it's gonna take a few years to kind of maybe come back on this or whatever, you know. And, it's not been easy, but I survived. I, I don't even think you can really recover. You, know, you just got to move forward and then keep things going. And I guess you can't. You can't. Nobody's going to be able to recover from it. You just kind of lick your wounds and, and say goodbye to the money, all the money you lost or that you had to take out of your savings. That's what I did, you know, to pay the bills. You know, you just move on. Loyal wants to move on now, hoping that COVID-19 stays at bay. Residents are thankful that they were able to celebrate what's important to this community, like their 2020 high school graduates. Loyal is trying to find ways to celebrate the city's 150th anniversary this year, since COVID wiped out many of the planned festivities. Acknowledging the historic anniversary is important to the people who live here. I think Loyal's lasted 150 years is, it's a small town. We know each other. We all have family that can go back several generations. So I wasn't born and raised in Loyal, but I married into Loyal, married into a family that's been here, I think two to three generations at least. So, you know, we're born and raised. This is, this is our town. I think it's important to remember our past and our history. Um, our children don't learn in school the history of our state and our towns the way they did when I was a child. And um, so I think it's really important that we expose it to our local people, the rest of the state and the entire United States because we need to raise patriots. We need to raise children who love our country. That the first thing isn't me, myself. The first thing is the community I live in that you do things for other people and you remember the people in the past who have done things for us. The hope for the next 150 years speaks somewhat to the city's motto, a city with room to grow. I hope that in 150 years we're still here, bigger, more business, that we're a thriving community still with a small town feel. I hope we never lose that. I think a quieter, simple life is in store for us in the future. Um, the quarantine has taught us to um, do a lot within our own community, even though we do not have a grocery store, a real, real grocery store. We do not have a pharmacy. We do not have a doctor, dentist, or a lawyer in town. We have to go out of town for those things. The bigger towns are the places where those people can make a better living, and they have gone there. So Loyal is pretty much a residential community, and I think it will survive, and it will continue to be a residential community because we have a good school system. One thing's for sure, no matter a pandemic or what happens next, it's a caring spirit that drives this small Wisconsin dairy town. 
I think as we come through this and out of this, it's helping each other now, hold each other up. As we come out of this, we're going to be really happy to see each other and what we've all done. Nobody's pounding their chest. Nobody's taking pride, you know, the, they're taking pride in what they're doing, but nobody wants kudos for it. Nobody wants press for it. They just want to do their part. That's the real world of like a loyal Wisconsin. Joining me now are Milwaukee PBS producers, Marianne Lazarski and Scotty Myers to talk about how COVID-19 impacted the production of Pandemic in the Heartland. Welcome. Okay, so the first question goes to Marianne. First, how did this idea of capturing the impact of COVID-19 in Loyal come about? So uh, a little background, um, last fall, we were one of five media organizations across the country to receive a grant from PBS Frontline for their local journalism initiative. And it was the first year that they were doing this. And our project was to do a documentary on uh, the dairy crisis in Wisconsin. And we were partnering with the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel and reporter Rick Barrett, who's been writing about this crisis for the past year. And so we were, you know, moving along on that uh, documentary and, and shooting in, uh, in Loyal and in Clark County. And uh, when the pandemic hit, uh, Frontline asked us to pivot a little bit and wanted us to do a story about how the pandemic is impacting rural America. And so we were already, you know, we established roots in, in Loyal, Wisconsin already and, um, you know, knew some folks there. And, and we thought that this would be uh, a good small, you know, town to portray how it's, you know, impacting them. Scotty, that impact from the coronavirus and COVID-19, it really affected how Milwaukee PBS, how the crew was able to capture the story there in Loyal. Can you talk about that? Yeah, this is a new normal that I think a lot of us are adjusting to. Milwaukee PBS is part of the Milwaukee Area Technical College. And so since we are a university licensee, we abide by their rules and regulations. And out of uh, you know, concerns for safety and, uh, and, and precautions to make sure everyone um, feels good about being in their respective workplaces, uh, we were not allowed to travel. We were not allowed to use our camera crews. Uh, this is problematic when you're trying to shoot a documentary in Clark County, Wisconsin. And so what we had to do was rely on the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, our partners in this project, and uh, Volume One, a publication in Eau Claire, and a videographer there named Joel Parrish. So we cannot say enough good things about Rick Barrett and photojournalist Mark Hoffman and these other people that we've leaned on. How did you find the Reith family and the other people who are featured in the documentary? Well, um, kind of a two-part uh, answer. So when we started working on the documentary on the Wisconsin dairy crisis, uh, we had traveled up to uh, Clark County in Loyal several times and, and got to know people. And the one person in particular was Sheila Nyberg, who was uh, featured uh, pr predominantly in the, um, in the documentary. And she is the economic development director for the county and, and head of tourism. And so she's, she knows just about everybody uh, you know, who lives there. And she gave us the name of uh, several families. And we visited a lot of dairy farms. Um, and did some research, and um, the Reith family just kind of, you know, they portray the kind of the typical small to middle-sized, you know, dairy farm family. Um, as you heard, the farm's been in the family since 1948, uh, so there's that emotional tie for them that, you know, they, they really want to hang on to this farm as, as best they can. 
Um, they have two adult sons, and uh, one in particular is is really interested in in keeping that going. And and you know that that's pretty typical. Um, and so we thought they would be a good farm family um, to follow. And so that's it's kind of how we met them. And then um, we relied on Rick Barrett's reporting uh, and you know his you know boots on the ground um, and going up to Loyal and meeting a lot of the small business owners. And so, you know, he, he talked and there was several more that we weren't able to uh, include in the documentary, but uh, he really kind of pinpointed, um, you know, who was willing to be interviewed and what their stories were. And so um, we relied heavily on him. So that's how those uh, interviews came to be. Great that you're able to make those connections through our partnership with the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. So Scotty, last question for you, what's next? Well, some things are up in the air, um, but what we do know is that we are going to continue to explore this story of small dairy farmers in Clark County, Wisconsin. This is, in many respects, the epicenter of the dairy industry here in Wisconsin and really throughout the nation, if not the world. Thank you, Scotty. Thank you, Marianne, for this talk back on this special edition of 1036 Pandemic in the Heartland.